presentation on exploring the African and indigenous roots of the Spanish language in Latin America and the Caribbean. I am Tamara Marie, and hopefully you'll find this presentation uh, insightful, not just from an academic perspective, but also from some practical ways that exploring this topic will influence and improve your ability to learn the Spanish language. So the agenda, what we're going to talk about in this presentation is one, the trouble with the term Latin American Spanish. So we'll talk a little bit about why that term is a little bit broad and a little bit too generic uh, to really be uh, really useful for language learning. So we'll explore that a little bit just to kind of give some context to our talk today. I'll also talk about why history matters, why culture matters, and why language diversity matters. And again, all of this is going to be from the perspective of not only how do we, you know, sort of look at some of the reasons why uh, Latin American Spanish sort of exists as this broad category, but also the practical implications for language learning and also teaching the Spanish language uh, as we move forward into the year 2020 and beyond. So I hope that you enjoy this presentation, hope that you learned something, and I hope that you find something immediately useful to help improve your Spanish study, or if you're a Spanish teacher, uh, to help you uh, uh, sort of give your students a little bit more context for the language, okay? So let's get started. So first, just a little bit about me. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Tamara Marie. I am a certified neuro language coach, uh, and that coaching certification is actually uh, given by Rachel Pauling uh, from Efficient Language Coaching uh, based in Germany. I'm also the founder of Spanish Con Salsa. We host uh, several different programs from uh, self-study courses online to group coaching, uh, and other programs as well. So uh, that is uh, the company I started, I guess about four years ago now, um, exclusively to teach Spanish to English speakers. I'm also the host of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast, where I explore learning Spanish through music, through culture, and through travel. Uh, and I'm the co-organizer of the Sisters Only Language Summit, which just started uh, this year in 2020. We had an event, a virtual event, uh, in April and also a one in July, and we will be having um, another Sisters Only Language Summit in January 2021, and this is specifically for uh, Black women in the language learning community. I'm also addicted to Latin music and travel, so as part of my interest in this topic is really a lot of my story about how I learned Spanish was really uh, through embracing the culture, and that's what really led me down this rabbit hole to really be able to explore uh, the real roots of the Spanish language as it's spoken in the Americas. Uh, and I'm also a proud mom. I'm raising my son with a passion for languages. He uh, obviously speaks English um, from the U.S. Uh, he also has taken an interest in Japanese, so he's been learning that lately as well, and, and also Spanish, right? So that's just a little bit about me. And also, uh, what really ties into this topic, I'm also the author, really more the editor of a series of bilingual phrase books that cover some of the Caribbean dialects of Spanish, so Cuban Spanish, Puerto Rican Spanish, Dominican Spanish. Uh, I've also recently published a book for uh, Costa Rican Spanish, which most people don't think about in the Caribbean, but there is a Caribbean coast uh, to Costa Rica as well. Uh, but yes, um, these are resources that when I was learning Spanish, I could not find, so I had to create them. Uh, and a lot of the reason for this was, you know, my journey to the Spanish language really came through my love of salsa music, uh, the dance, the culture, and uh, traveling to these different regions. And I felt so unprepared with the Spanish that I had learned through uh, traditional courses um, that, you know, I really realized what the issue was eventually was that these dialects just were not taught. Um, and, there's, and there's several reasons for that, and we'll get into that in the presentation, but uh, working with a team really in, in each of these islands, I was able to compile a really comprehensive list of words and phrases, not just idiomatic expressions, but all, all sorts of vocabulary, uh, several hundred words for each island, some words common to all, but some that are unique, in fact, most that are unique uh, just to Cuba, uh, Dominican Republic, or Puerto Rico. So this was a, a project that I took on just to really fill a void uh, that I saw that really I experienced um, as a language learner and a traveler. So uh, this is uh, the books I have available right now. So it's at Caribbean Spanish 101.com if you're interested in checking those out. Okay, so let's get to the presentation. Now, first, let's deal with the problem. And I talked about Latin American Spanish being problematic, right? So if you are a language learner, 
first of all, Spanish is all is always seen as one of these easy quote unquote languages to learn for various reasons with especially if you're a native English speaker uh, or if you speak any of the other romance languages, Spanish is usually seen as one of the quote unquote easier languages. Um, it's usually also offered with two general options. Uh, what's called uh, peninsular or sometimes Castilian Spanish, which is European Spanish. And then there's this broad category, <laughs> right, of Latin American Spanish. So a lot of times if you look for a course or an app, you will find one of these two main categories. Now, there is some trouble with this designation, in my opinion, of Latin American Spanish. And I'll talk a little bit about why I find this problematic and why I think um, we could better serve language learners uh, if we sort of look at this a little bit more, um, not as broad, but a little bit more specific as it relates to the different cultures that comprise Latin America. So what is Latin American Spanish? Okay, so there's a definition I got from dictionary.com. It's the collective Spanish dialects of the Americas as spoken in Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. Okay, so that's a very, very broad stretch of geography. Uh, that's covered by this one term. And while I understand the need to classify things, um, I find this classification a bit broad, all right? So besides what most people uh, learn when you start learning Spanish and you go, what's the difference between Spanish spoken in Spain and Latin American Spanish? Most people will just tell you, oh, well, you know, in Latin America, they don't use vosotros for the second person plural, they use ustedes. Uh, they might also say, ah, there's this aseo, which is in Latin America, the C and Z, uh, or the C and Z, are pronounced just like the letter S, instead of in Spain, where it's pronounced more like this theta, or like a th sort of sound. Um, but besides that, there's not much importance given to the broad range of Spanish that's spoken by over 422 million people throughout the different countries in Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. So even those three categories are broad because they comprise different regions and not just countries, but regions within those countries that all have linguistic differences. So this is part of the trouble with this term, Latin American Spanish, you're not really given a lot of detail. The general classification of Latin American Spanish does have some problematic assumptions. The first one is that the Spanish language itself is not linguistically diverse. Now, I've already talked about how Spanish has a perception in language learning circles as being a quote unquote easy language to learn. But there's also this perception that, you know, there's other languages like, you know, Chinese, you've got Mandarin, you've got Cantonese, you've got all of these other uh, differences and they're, they're so different that it's worthy of separating them into dialects and teaching them differently. But Spanish really isn't that diverse. Spanish is Spanish is what most people will say. And you can just grasp the fundamentals, right? So that's an assumption that the Spanish language itself is really just not that diverse. But the truth is each country in Latin America has its own unique culture, its own unique history, and its own unique mix of people, okay? So language is a living entity and it's transformed by the people who speak it. So if you look at this map, of course, uh, excluding Haiti and Brazil, where they speak French and Portuguese respectively, um, all of these countries that you see on this map here uh, have a large population of Spanish speakers, and most of them have Spanish as the official language. Now, of course, uh, most of the Caribbean islands, some of those smaller islands there uh, do not have Spanish as the official language, but we know like the main ones I've mentioned already, you've got Cuba, you've got Dominican Republic, uh, and you've got Puerto Rico, which technically is not a country, it's a territory of the United States, but that's a story for a different, uh, a different time. But essentially, you've got, you know, this wide area of the Caribbean, you've got all of these countries in Central America, and you've got this huge stretch of South America where there are vastly different people, vastly different regions, vastly different um, histories to how these people came to live in all of these different places, that there's a lot of diversity in the people. So I think it's a little bit naive to assume that the language spoken there won't be equally as diverse, even though it all, fun, fun, even though it all falls, excuse me, under the category of Latin American Spanish. Now, the second assumption with this term is that the differences in Spanish spoken in these countries is just quote unquote slang, it's colloquialisms. And it's not really important to learn any of these to really gain proficiency in Spanish. So from an academic perspective, you could probably, you know, pass a grammar test. <clears throat> you could probably learn a lot of the fundamentals of the language uh, without getting into these 
uh, sort of nuances and these differences, and it's not super important. This is what I've been told, and this is what a lot of people uh, assume when they're learning Spanish. But the fact is, there are many features of the Spanish language that differ by country and region, and this is not limited to colloquialism. So there's also pronunciation, intonation, grammar, which most people don't think about, but there are some grammatical differences, and I'll talk about those later in this presentation. And then also just very basic vocabulary, right? So usually when we think of slang and colloquialisms, we think of this informal language, this thing that maybe is spoken between friends and family uh, in informal settings, you know, sort of at the bar, sort of in, in the house, sort of in the, like kitchen speak, as they sometimes call it. We think of these very informal situations, but the fact of the matter is there's some very basic vocabulary that cannot be just uh, relegated to the realm of slang and informal idioms. So for example, I have this picture here and I always tell this story <laughs> because it was one of those things that I had to learn the hard way as I traveled. So there's this picture of a fruit and it's not a fruit native to where I live. And I didn't know what it was called uh, when I first encountered it. And the first time I had this fruit, I was in Puerto Rico and they told me, ah, that's called parcha. I said, okay, parcha. And I ordered, you know, juice or, you know, ice cream, whatever that was. And I ordered it and I knew the name for it. So I said, okay, parcha. <laughs> then later I went to Dominican Republic, which is not very far from Puerto Rico and it's in the Caribbean as well. So I thought, okay, well, I know how to order this now because I've learned a new word. Again, this is just vocabulary for a fruit. This isn't sort of kitchen talk. This is just, you know, me ordering a drink or, or some ice cream. So I said, traeme un bebida de, de parcha. And the guy just kind of looked at me like, which means, you know, bring me a, 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 a sort of like a milkshake or a smoothie, right? Made of parcha. And he kind of looked at me and said, chinola. <clears throat> I said, like, chinola, okay. Uh, Dame una chinola, <laughs> right? So I said, give me, give me chinola, which I didn't know. That's the name for it. In Dominican Republic. Now, I wouldn't have assumed that another Caribbean island that's so close would have a very, very different word. I mean, this, this word doesn't even sound the same. Uh, so I went later to Costa Rica and I had learned my lesson. I said, let me look up this word. What is it in Costa Rica? <laughs> so I looked on a Costa Rican website and I found out there and in much of Central America actually is called Maracuja. And also I think in South America, it's known as that as well. Uh, later I learned, you know, English is his passion fruit, right? So uh, again, but this is just sort of basic vocabulary. This isn't slang. This wasn't informal. This was just like the name of a fruit. And something that simple uh, can be very, very different depending on where you are. And that's important because it can cause a lot of misunderstandings if you don't really have this in mind. And if someone just tells you, oh, you learned Latin American Spanish, you might be wondering as you travel sort of like, why is it that what I learned as quote unquote Latin American Spanish is not working for me. So that's a very practical, basic example as a language learner that you run into problems if you don't realize that this category may not be 100% helpful. Okay. And just as a side note, I later found out Venezuela, they actually used the word parchita. So it now has four names that I know of, <laughs> but it's my favorite fruit. So I have to know the name. Okay. The third assumption with this broad category is that there are ample resources in Spanish for intermediate and advanced learners to figure out these differences. And beginners really don't need to worry with these, these sorts of details, right? So when you're intermediate and advanced, you can go and search in Espanol, so you can look for things in Spanish, and of course you'll find out what these differences are. And as you come across people, of course they'll be able to tell you. Well, the fact of the matter is most people learn most native speakers they learn the language that they grew up with and they may not necessarily know that there is a different word for a certain thing now obviously unless it's a more popular dialect for instance like mexican spanish which again there's some variations even within uh, mexico for how spanish is spoken however broadly speaking uh, because there's so much media that comes from mexico and there's so many um, actors and actresses and series people are familiar with sort of how mexicans speak spanish in latin america because of that so, sure, it might be, you know, more, uh, more wide, widely known. However, by and large, you know, if I grew up in Colombia, I might not know the word for uh, passion fruit, right, in, in Puerto Rico. It's why would I know that, right? So to, to believe that native speakers will be able to help you with this can be a little bit naive because everyone may not be uh, that well-traveled. And these resources really do not exist online. This is why... Uh, I had to develop resources for Caribbean Spanish in particular because I couldn't find those resources when I was a learner. 
So, and I consider myself a lifelong learner. I'm always learning things. But when I was starting out on my journey with learning Spanish, um, I really couldn't find anything. So I think this assumption that these resources exist and that it's not important to beginners is not a good assumption, okay? So the fact is there are very few of any resources for some of the most popular Spanish dialects, even in Spanish, and not understanding the features of Spanish in different regions can cause both frustration and stagnation even for beginners. And as I explained some of the differences, hopefully it becomes apparent why that is. But I do think it's important because uh, language is spoken by people. And if you don't understand those people, it's very difficult to communicate with them. So some of these features of the language are important and actually do impact even the fundamentals. So now let's talk about why history matters. And you might be thinking this is going to turn into a history lesson. I promise I, I'll keep it light. But the idea is that you want to really understand how Spanish got to Latin America and why it's so different. We've already talked about the number of countries uh, that speak Spanish uh, in Latin America, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail into some of these historical influences. And we'll also talk about the indigenous and African cultures that come in as well. So the roots of Latin American Spanish in particular have a lot of influences from the Spanish conquistadores or uh, conquerors, as they may be known among the indigenous people in Latin America. Uh, they were mainly from the region of Andalusia, and they really helped print, uh, shape the pronunciation of Latin American Spanish. So anecdotally, for example, I have a friend from Puerto Rico, and he told me that when he was in the military, he was traveling throughout Spain and Europe, and he said he really didn't understand what people were saying in Spain until he went to Andalusia and he was in a bar and he goes, oh, finally somebody that's talking like I can understand. So that's again, just anecdotally, but uh, there are uh, some linguistic uh, um, features of the language spoken in Southern Spain that showed up in Latin America simply because that's where the explorers, quote unquote, or conquistadores, depending on your frame of history, that's where they, they largely came from. So a lot of the features of Latin American Spanish come from particularly this region of Spain, although there are some differences um, between them as well. So let's just talk briefly about the pre-Columbian Americas. So as everyone I'm sure is aware, you know, Columbus is this explorer that's noted with the discovery of uh, the Americas, even though there were people already living there who had already explored quite a bit. Um, the, the fable goes that Columbus made this discovery in the late 1400s. But the problem with that was there's already a diverse population of indigenous people living throughout the Americas. Uh, and this is the map I found. It gives you some idea of some of the different uh, people, uh, some of the different tribes that were there. Uh, but again, this just shows you the diversity of the people that were there before the Spanish language even came into play. And each one of these cultures had their own languages and they already had their own trade and, and even wars between them. So there was already a complex society that was here in the Americas prior to uh, Columbus coming here uh, in the late 1400s. And this is just something from the Library of Congress that I found. And I just wanted to, to sort of bring this up because I think a lot of times when people talk about indigenous people, they think about sort of people in the Amazon rainforest who don't really have sophisticated language and, and don't wear clothes and things like that. But this was um, noted by a historian uh, and again, Library of Congress, I have the, the source here if you want to look this up in more detail. Uh, but he says, writing was independently invented in Mesoamerica, and the Maya glyphic system stands out for its creation of syllabic and pictorial writing in one of the most visually diverse scripts ever conceived. So this picture here on the right is actually from the Library of Congress. They, they kind of show you a piece of that. Um, and the reason why this is important is because Indigenous people didn't simply disappear, okay? So the languages and the culture mixed with the Spanish and African influences that came from the outside. Um, and so this picture here is actually of a Taino uh, sculpture. And this is, again, uh, from the Caribbean area mainly. So this is from Puerto Rico. That's where this was found. Uh, but these are how the people looked, right? These, these people were already there. And even though, yes, people know that there was history of conquest and a lot of people died from disease and from war and from quite frankly, outright slaughter, everyone didn't disappear, right? Some people did survive and parts of their language and culture also survived. And it, the way it survived is that it mixed with the Spanish language. So we talked a little bit about the indigenous influence on Spanish spoken in Latin America, but the African influence was also very present. 
Um, and this is a quote from a book I have called Afro Latino Voices. And it just kind of broadly states that African and African descent peoples played central roles in building Spanish and Portuguese empires and their American colonies from the 1500s through the 1800s. Okay, and this picture is here, I actually took this picture from the Museo Histórico de Cartagena de India. So this was in, in Cartagena, Colombia, which is a, a coastal city, and it was a huge slave port um, during this time period. And, and a lot of people don't know this, in South America is actually one of the last places to abolish slavery, actually in Brazil, uh, which again is Portuguese speaking, but just sort of illustrates the point that there was a large population of Africans that were brought uh, from the continent to the Americas and brought to South America, to the Caribbean, and also uh, to North America. And most people are familiar with the, the history of, of North America, but they don't really think a lot about um, the African descendants that live in Latin America. And there's many reasons for that. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But I just wanted to point this out that once again, you have now a whole different group of people that are coming with their culture, with their food, with their language, and they didn't simply just disappear but the way that uh, African culture has survived is that it mixed in with the Spanish culture uh, that kind of all was imported, right, from Spain uh, and from Africa to the Americas. So it's a big mix. It's a big, it's a big mix. Now, I want to talk a little bit about why history matters, too. And this is uh, from the perspective of some of the whitewashing of history that has been done in Latin America. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been told in traveling that uh, you know, oh, there's not really not racism in Latin America the same way there is in North America. That's a that's a U.S. problem. However, there are some subtle ways in which um, African people have been sort of uh, blotted out of history, particularly in Argentina. There's actually even a saying, no hay negros in Argentina. So there's no black people in Argentina. However, Argentine tango, which comes from Buenos Aires, actually has its roots in African music and dance that was born from uh, these uh, sort of get-togethers called condombes, and this would be musicians in the street, and that's the picture on the left is actually a picture from a painting from Buenos Aires in the 1800s where you actually see African people on the street sort of with their drums. Uh, this region was called tambores because of the presence of sort of the drumming that you would hear in the capital, and you might see if you look over to the left, there is a, a, a Caucasian man. He's got sort of like a, a red sash on. He's sitting down next to an African man, and they're sort of watching the show. And there's even a woman standing behind them. And it said that he was, you know, sort of one of the government officials from the region. He was coming to get votes, right? So that was kind of what he was doing, because actually, Black people in Argentina could vote at that time, where even in the U.S., uh, Black men and women couldn't vote um, at the same time. So anyway, just kind of like a historical note, most people would not look at that picture on the left and think Argentina. Most of the time you would look at the picture on the right and go, ah, it's tango, it's from, you know, Buenos Aires. But it has its roots in African culture. And in fact, uh, re very recently, uh, Afro-Argentines have been fighting to be recognized uh, as, as, as a group because a lot of people say that there aren't any black people in Argentina. So much so to the point, anecdotally again, when I went to Argentina, uh, which is another long story, but just kind of <laughs> the point that relates here. I was racially profiled. You know, I walked into a building and the security guard looked right at me and told me to go to the Quinto Piso, the fifth floor. And I hadn't said anything to him, but the uh, Brazilian consulate was on the fifth floor. So because he saw me, he saw I was black, he just assumed that I was Brazilian and I needed to go to the Brazilian consulate. And ironically, I did for another reason, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> I talk about it on my podcast, so I won't get into it now. But the point is, you know, even walking the streets in Buenos Aires, I was sort of seen as an alien. I mean, people were literally asking me about my skin color and that they've never seen it before and how my hair was. I mean, I was really uh, a little bit like an, an alien there. Um, and because it was just because people hadn't seen black people in, in Buenos Aires. And, you know, and again, it's not that there weren't black people there. It's just that uh, they've been blotted out of history. And a lot of them, um, through, for a number of different reasons, uh, were killed. But that's something that you can look into in, in more detail. But this is really important because I think a lot of times we sort of take the narrative that's given to us. We sort of believe that things sort of, everything's this, this nice, beautiful picture, and there's no real racial inequality or racial in, in, injustice. And the way in which African language and the way in which um, indigenous languages persist and the peoples also persist in these regions is important to recognize. And uh, 
noting that it exists in the language and in the culture is a way to really give some credence to this and also to help the people that are still there uh, in these, in these uh, communities um, really claim their stake that this is also their culture. So I think it's important, especially if you're going to be a traveler and a language learner, to understand these differences and nuances so that you're not surprised like I was when <laughs> I went to Buenos Aires and only saw four Black people. Okay, so now let's talk about why culture matters, all right? Culture is the characteristics and knowledge of a particular group of people encompassing language, religion, cuisine, social habits, music, and arts. So that's a really widely accepted definition of culture. And why this matters is that language is just a component of culture. So language does not exist in a vacuum. I, I, I say this quite a bit, that language itself is not something that you can just go off into a dark corner and master all of the grammar rules without understanding the culture. Not knowing the culture and the people that speak the language cripples your ability to understand it. You know, and I'm very adamant about this because it's something that I learned the hard way, um, but I also happen to love culture and I love uh, traveling and exploring different cultures and meeting people and learning about them and their worldview. It's not just, you know, sort of, you know, getting the grammar charts right, right? There's a lot more to it um, than that. And language is just a component of culture. So when you flip the script and you really look at it from the perspective that culture is what matters and language comes in as a part of it, it really gives you an appreciation for understanding the language itself because it's a lot more than just words. Um, and the picture here I have on the right is actually another picture from Cartagena, uh, one of my favorite places now <laughs> to visit. This is a traditional dance that was done outside of um, sort of the downtown area they do at night. Um, but it is sort of a beautiful display, but you can see some of the traditional culture is still being practiced even now uh, in, in the city of Cartagena. Now, here is an example of this. And again, I've, I've talked about this uh, because I learned Spanish through salsa music, largely in, in bachata and other uh, Caribbean music. Uh, I learned that Caribbean Spanish really had been undervalued, right? So it really hadn't even really been identified or taught anywhere. Uh, however, it's become a worldwide presence. And that's mainly through its wildly popular music, dance, art, and cuisine that comes from the region. So if you don't understand Caribbean culture, it can make it really hard to understand Spanish, not only spoken in the Caribbean, but also in its diaspora. And it's not just the islands of, of Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic and Cuba. It's also uh, the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica, the Caribbean coast of Venezuela, the Caribbean coast of Colombia, which Cartagena is a part of. So it's not just sort of limited to the islands themselves or other countries, even Panama, that have a Caribbean coast. And because the music and the dance and the culture is so rich, they really exported the culture um, and people. I mean, there's a huge diaspora of Spanish speakers from the Caribbean, even in Europe and uh, all over the Americas and in North America as well. So if you think about it, when you have this something that's so popular, I mean, it's people who dance salsa and music, which actually this picture here to the right uh, is a picture from the 50s. It's from a, a club called the Palladium, which actually was not in Latin America. It was in New York. And this is another place where there are huge immigrant communities from Latin America, particularly the Caribbean, that sort of all came together to create this new style of dance uh, called salsa and the music as well. It was really a mesh of different uh, Latin American cultures. So this has been exported throughout the Spanish speaking world to the point that even in Spain, I mean, the music that comes from the Caribbean is being listened to. So you have to really give this some thought when you're thinking about, well, linguistically, what language is propped up as the proper Spanish? And then what language will you encounter in the real world? And culture is really important because culture is exported. Uh, again, it's a way that people sort of uh, share who they are through their art, through the music, through dance. And that's something that can be easily and readily made available to people from outside of that one small piece of, of earth, right, where they may actually live. Um, so culture is really important because it spreads, it spreads knowledge about people and their culture, but it also spreads language. All right. So now that we're talking about language again, let's get into linguistic diversity and why it matters, particularly as it relates to Spanish. And I love this quote by David Crystal. It says, the only languages which do not change are dead ones. 
Okay, so that's the definition of a dead language. It's a language that you don't speak. So as long as people are speaking a language, it will always be changing. It will always be evolving. It will always be growing in different ways. And the more diverse the groups of people are that speak that language, the more diverse the language itself becomes. So that's why I think this is so important. Uh, and if you just look at the list of countries where Spanish is spoken, I think it's very, very clear that uh, there is some diversity here because each one of these countries has its own, for example, uh, Dia de Independencia. So everyone has their own Independence Day. Uh, everyone celebrates it. There's a lot of pride around it, uh, especially around, you know, waving the flags, especially around the football. Like, you know, people are, when the World Cup is going on, you see all the different flags of the different countries. Uh, but that's just one form of diversity to different countries, but there's all different regions within these countries. And if you think about all the countries where Spanish is spoken, there is uh, something to be said for expre uh, appreciating, excuse me, the diversity in the language and acknowledging that if I go to Honduras, they have a different history, a different way of speaking than the people in Peru, right? And having that respect for the language and actually taking the time to investigate it as a language learner before you just sort of talk to someone from one of these areas or go visit one of these countries and assume that you know and you understand uh, because you studied in a textbook, right? <laughs> and they told you that this was the right word for this and this is how people should talk. Really taking the time to be humble and to, and to get to know the people from all of these different places um, as you're learning the language. And what I always recommend to language learners is to sort of pretend you're a native speaker, right? Pick one of these countries and, you know, sort of pretend this is where you're from, right? And, and sort of consume content from that country, right? Like if you're not able to actually go there and do a language exchange or, or go study at a language school and do a homestay, for example, to really get that immersive experience, you can direct sort of the content that you consume um, around one of these countries and a region within those countries. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because that's really how native speakers acquired the language. They sort of grew up with the language that their family spoke. Uh, and if you're listening, especially as a beginner, if you're listening to Spanish from like uh, Cuba, for example, and then you go listen to something from Costa Rica, you know, it's going to be very, very different. From Costa Rica, you're going to be hearing a lot, ah, pura vida, pura vida. <laughs> you're going to be like, what does that mean, right? And in and, and Cuba, they just have a different way of speaking. And you'll get very, very confused as a beginner if you, if you try to sort of mix these up because you might think, wow, I've been studying Spanish for X amount of months or for a year or two years, and I still don't understand people when they speak. Well, if you've only been talking to people from, say, Guatemala, but then you go listen to something from Cuba, you might not understand it, but it might not be because your Spanish is bad. It's just because the way they speak is different in Cuba. And it's not, like I said before, it's not just um, sort of the slang, but there, there are other features to the language that are really important that could really interfere with your ability to understand the language, regardless of how well you do on a grammar test. And why this matters, you know, is that Latin American dialects have largely been overlooked by the academic community, and they've been dismissed as just informal. So like I talked about this idea that, oh, it's just slang, you know, it's not really important, you won't need it in a formal setting, or if you have a job, you know, it's not really something you need to learn if you're, you know, really wanting to master the language. Uh, in particular, dialects that have large populations of Afro-Latino speakers are often viewed as improper or even wrong, right, ways of speaking Spanish. So that's a, that's a big reason why I believe that there aren't as many resources because it's viewed as, well, we should all try to speak the standard Spanish, which I'm, I'm not even sure where that, what that is, right? <laughs> where that, who, who's from the country standard? Like, I don't even know who those people are. But there's this move of like, oh, well, once, once you realize that, oh, I'm from Puerto Rico and they call, uh, let's say, naranjas, right? So oranges, they call them china. And once I learned that other people don't call it China and they call it Naranja, then now I've learned, oh, the way I learned growing up is now non-standard and this other Spanish is the standard Spanish. You know, that really doesn't always fly because everyone doesn't, again, get to the point where they begin to understand those differences. And who's to say that the word used for orange in Puerto Rico is invalid and the word used for orange in, let's say, Costa Rica is. So again, this diversity, I think, is important to also preserve the cultures of all of these Spanish-speaking countries. This also leaves a community of language learners underserved and really unserved 
And there's also a growing population of heritage language learners that want to communicate with their families. So there's a huge Latin American diaspora. There are people who live throughout the United States in different cities and countries, but also, as I mentioned, throughout Europe and other places. And they really want to connect with their families, right? With their parents, their grandparents, their cousins, some of them who probably still live in the countries that their families left. And they're unable to do that because the Spanish in their countries of origin is simply not taught in their language courses, which renders their language education almost useless. Because the minute they go back and try to talk to their families, they're unable to keep up with the conversation. They don't understand what people are saying. And when they try to communicate with their family members, they get made fun of because they're like, well, what are you, why are you talking like that? Why are you talking so formal? Why are you talking, what, where did you learn that word? Or why, why do you say it that way? Because again, these types of, uh, changes or these types of differences in the Spanish language are viewed as informal and unimportant when in fact to make them useful for a language learner in their day-to-day -day life you actually have to teach them the way that people speak. All right so now that I've talked a little bit about the history I've talked about the culture and linguistic diversity I'm going to now delve, delve into uh, the indigenous and African words that actually are present in the Spanish language and this is just to just sort of make a point about what I've been saying this whole time. These things matter, these things are important, and not knowing the history, not knowing the roots, not knowing the culture can really make it hard for you to understand the language and the people that speak it. So let's look at some Spanish words that you may or may not have known actually come from indigenous and African languages. So the first one is called Mavi, and it's a drink that's actually made of tree bark, and this is uh, from the Caribbean. And this is, again, from the indigenous languages of the Caribbean, but it was consumed into the Spanish language. And then we have maíz, which I think a lot of people won't find uh, surprising. <laughs> this is actually corn in English. It's a vegetable that's uh, grown in the Americas. So very, very famous. And in fact, you know, at least in North America, it's I think the, the one of the most grown crops even to this day. But we know that this was something that was grown in the Americas. Uh, so it wasn't originally a part of the Spanish language, but it was absorbed into the language later uh, after it came to the Americas. Then we have a fruit, guayaba. And this actually comes from a tree that's native to Central America and Mexico. And this is an, um, from an indigenous language because the tree is native to this area. So the people that uh, identified it first were native to this area. So the word was here before the Spaniards came. So this is another one that's gotten consumed into the Spanish language as Spanish, but it has its roots in the indigenous languages of the Americas. Then we have an Africanismo, is guarapo. And this is actually a juice that's made from sugar cane. So again, if you sort of think about uh, some of the crops that were grown in South America and even in the southern parts of North America, Central America, and the Caribbean, uh, because of the, the similarities in the climate, some of those things are also able to be grown in Africa. So something like sugar cane uh, that came from Africa, and then there's, of course, if you know the history, there's a lot of sugar cane uh, that was a main uh, staple of most of the Caribbean and also in parts of South America, that you have this drink called guarapo <clears throat> that actually has its roots in, in African languages. Then we have jautia. And this is another a word from the indigenous languages of the Americas. And this is actually a tuber vegetable that's grown mainly in the Caribbean. It's used in a lot of Caribbean um, cuisine. And it's a really starchy vegetable, uh, kind of similar to a potato. Uh, but again, it's used a lot in, in the cooking from the, the region. But this is also something that was originally cultivated by the indigenous people of the Americas. So the word itself comes uh, from that root. Then we have mofongo. And I was actually surprised about this one because I love mofongo. I first had it in Puerto Rico. They make it in other places as well. But it's made from these fried and mashed green plantains or platanos. And this actually is an Africanismo. This came from Africa. Um, so plantains, again, a very important uh, crop in uh, the Caribbean and South America, also grown a lot in Africa. So the cuisine uh, again, the culture is carried along with the language, with, with the words into the Spanish language and into what is now uh, considered Latin American culture. Uh, but all of that sort of is, is mixed up in this one word, mofongo. Then we have uh, another indigenous word, guanime. And this is uh, actually a food that's made from this harina de maíz. So this is like corn flour. Then we have funche. That's another uh, word that comes from Africa. It's sort of a spongy bread made from corn flour. Yame, 
which is a root vegetable. It's usually translated as yam, but there's many different varieties, like the picture here. Uh, it's another sort of tuber. Uh, again, a word that comes from Africa. And then papa, which most of us know is potatoes, but these were originally harvested in America, so this is another indigenous word. And we have malanga, another tuber vegetable. There's a lot of tuber vegetables, <laughs> but this one came from Africa. Cacao, which I think a lot of us know because uh, it's used to make chocolate, but this has been used by indigenous people in the Americas for many, many years. So this word cacao also comes from uh, the indigenous people of the Americas. And also, you know, there's some grammar implications to this linguistic diversity as well. For instance, in some regions of Colombia, usted is used instead of tú for, the in, for informal situations like the second person pronoun you. Uh, in Argentina and parts of Central America, which most people don't know. This is thought of as something that's only in Argentina, but also, you know, some regions of South America, but also parts of Central America also use vos instead of tu. Um, even though this is considered archaic, it's still in daily use. So again, it's something else that's not really taught a lot unless you study, you know, Argentine Spanish, for example. Uh, you really won't learn a lot about voceo, which is the use of vos instead of tu. Uh, but it is used, right? So this is something that is still widely used. And this is, again, how these differences in Spanish spoken in Latin America can matter even when it comes to studying grammar, because there's a different verb conjugation that goes along with each one of these. And also in Caribbean Spanish, the word order can be inverted. So instead of como estas tú, you could hear como tú está, so things like that. So that's also important when you're learning word order when it comes to grammar, just to kind of be aware of some of these differences. So even when it comes to grammar, uh, understanding that Latin American Spanish is not this one broad uh, category can be really, really detrimental if you don't take it into account. All right. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation that you've learned something. Here are just a couple more resources that you can check out. Uh, CaribbeanSpanish101.com, African Roots of Tango. There's a really good video there on YouTube you can watch. Lucia Hablamos, which uh, tries to sort of capture some of the differences in the dialects of different countries. There's also this Dictionary of Africanismos, which is more like a word list, but it was made by the University of Bayamón in Puerto Rico, so it's really good. And um, John Leguizamo has this really funny thing on Netflix, Latin History for Morons. Uh, it's obviously a comedy, but he does uh, incorporate a lot of Latin American history, especially from the perspective of the indigenous people there. So it's really interesting, kind of a fun watch if you want more of a lighthearted way to tackle this subject. So uh, if you want to get in touch with me, Tamara at SpanishConSalsa.com. I'm also on Instagram at LearnSpanishConSalsa. And I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And thank you so much. Gracias uh, for taking the time to listen. And thank you to the organizers for allowing me to be part of the Polyglot Conference 2020. Adios.